president of Power Over Parkinson's, and today in conjunction with our POP Profile series, we have Dr. Brett Youngerman, assistant professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery at Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Youngerman, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's really a privilege and an honor. Uh, I'm a firm believer uh, in the work that Power Over Parkinson's is doing and your, your emphasis on uh, exercise and wellness for patients with Parkinson's disease. It's really such an important part uh, of managing the disease. Yeah, well, thank you for spending some time with us today. Um, as we get started, share a little bit about, uh, share with our listeners a little bit about your background and what led you to a career in neurology and neurosurgery. Sure, uh, absolutely. So, I mean, it, it's a little bit cliche, but I think most people, you know, go into medicine because they're interested in, in finding ways to, to help people. Uh, I was particularly interested in surgery because it allows you to do that in a very concrete and tangible way. Um, but, you know, the the brain and the nervous system is, is the body's control center, and it supports these amazing capabilities, everything from basic functions like sense of smell and taste to physically walking and exercising to things as complex as creating music and literature. So it's, it's an endlessly fascinating organ and one of the final frontiers in medicine. And the, the type of neurosurgery that I do is called functional neurosurgery. Uh, and we're really privileged to be able to interact with the brain uh, to restore its function. Very good. I think what you've touched on is so, uh, it probably resonates a lot with our listeners as far as those intricacies and those small things that people don't necessarily think about when they think of neurology, just the sense of smell, taste, and all these um, smaller areas that it touches. Um, as we move on, something that I like to ask many of our interviewer, interviewees who work within this space, um, you know, there's an inevitable decline with people with these types of neurological disorders. How do you remain hopeful and optimistic um, as you work with within this arena? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, especially in, in dealing with patients who may be candidates for surgery, we do often see people with some of the most severe disease. Uh, and just as the brain and the nervous system can support all those amazing functions, uh, when people start to lose some of those functions, it, it can really be devastating and create this, this great sense of loss. And, and we don't yet have a cure uh, for Parkinson's disease. But we, we do have uh, great therapies uh, that we can significantly help to improve quality of life and, and restore function. And so uh, I like to focus uh, when I'm meeting uh, people with Parkinson's disease on, on their goals in dealing with their disease and getting them back to the activities that they care about. So whether that's something simple like going for a walk or being able to sip a cup of coffee without spilling it because of the tremor, uh, being able to restore those functions for patients is extremely rewarding. Uh, so I always talk to patients with, um, with Parkinson's when I, when I meet them for the first time, I ask them, you know, what bothers them most about their, their Parkinson's disease. And when it's something we can improve with surgery, you know, that's very exciting to me, but there's almost always something uh, that we collectively as a community can do to help with, with symptoms and empower patients with, with every aspect of Parkinson's disease. Well, at a high level, can you explain to our listeners what DBS or deep brain stimulation is and what's entailed in that procedure? Sure. So it, it's ultimately a device uh, that delivers a very small amount of electrical stimulation to a specific target in the brain uh, that controls movement. Uh, and that helps restore normal movement in patients with Parkinson's disease or, or tremor. Uh, so the surgery involves two parts. Uh, the first part is putting these very thin wires uh, that we call electrodes into the brain, uh, either on one side or, or on both sides. And then the second part is connecting those wires up to a pacemaker-like device that actually delivers the stimulation. Uh, and that's implanted uh, in the chest under the skin below, below the collarbone. And the entire system is then hidden uh, underneath the skin uh, so that nobody can see it when you're, when you're walking around uh, using it and receiving the stimulation. And, and then the programming occurs uh, over time uh, with a smartphone or tablet-like device that, that your doctor operates uh, in the office Office or can even actually operate in some cases remotely uh, now is, is one of the more recent technologies. And then patients also have some control uh, over the settings uh, as well to try and optimize uh, their, their stimulation. And, okay. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say as a follow-up, what kind of um, maintenance is entailed in this as well? Yeah, so it's 
so the programming is something that can be you know, somewhat intensive in, in a few meetings for the, for the first uh, few months to get the right settings. Uh, and then after that, uh, the, the spacing uh, spaces out in terms of how often you need to see your doctor to, to have it uh, adjusted. Uh, and then the, in the past, all the devices needed to be replaced uh, every few years, at least the battery in the chest needed to be replaced every few years. Uh, but some of the newer models actually allow for a rechargeable option similar to your, uh, your phone that you can leave on a charging pad. Uh, there's a device that you just hold over your skin and it can actually charge the device uh, through the skin. Um, you know, all this seems can seem a little science fiction-y, but it's this is technology that's been around for for more than twenty years, approved by the FDA. You know, many high quality studies, uh, and for the right patients, can can really be quite life changing. Well, you've dovetailed into my next question. Talk to us about who would be um, an eligible candidate for this procedure. Yeah, so this is for for patients with. Parkinson's disease for, for a few years, uh, typically more than four years, although that's, that's not absolute. Uh, but most importantly, uh, their symptoms are just not well controlled with medication. And, and so there's, there's two scenarios here that, that can overlap. One is, is tremor that's not well controlled. Uh, and that can be tremor that never responded to the levodopa medications, or maybe it responded in the past and isn't responding anymore. Uh, deep brain stimulation can be very effective for the tremor. The other scenario uh, is the stiffness or rigidity and, and the slowness or the bradykinesia. Uh, and in many cases that initially responds to the levodopa, but now uh, a person may be having longer severe wearing off periods or they're requiring more medications and they're having abnormal uncontrolled movements uh, called dyskinesias as side effects from those medications. So for those patients, uh, far, the deep brain stimulation can be uh, very helpful as well. Okay. It, does not help with, uh, with balance or with freezing of gait. Um, it probably doesn't help with, with speech, although that's an area that some people are working on. And it doesn't help with thinking problems, so cognitive issues, dementia, or problems with mood like depression. And it's not a cure for the underlying disease, uh, but it can be you know, a, significant, uh, a significant part of therapy and improving quality of life uh, for, for the motor symptoms. And probably helping to meet the goals that you referenced earlier. So sipping a cup of coffee or taking a walk to meeting those goals. Absolutely. It can really you know, change a person's you know, everyday functions and what they're, what they're able to do for themselves. Sure. Well, tell us a little bit about the risks associated with this procedure. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a well-established therapy at this point. It's, it's been done actually in over 100,000 patients worldwide. It's, it's a minimally invasive surgery, so it's a small surgery, but it's still a surgery that involves the brain. So there, there are definitely risks that need to be taken into consideration when deciding to do this. Um, there are surgical risks uh, like bleeding, stroke, uh, in, infection. Uh, fortunately, these are very rare these days at, at experience centers. We have a lot of improvements in technology like MRI navigation and intraoperative imaging that allow us to avoid blood vessels and, and hit our target uh, more accurately. Uh, but there's, but there's you know, still those surgical risks. And then there's potential side effects of the stimulation itself. Uh, it can have an effect, a negative effect on speech. It can cause abnormal sensations of tingling or face pulling. And in some patients, uh, there's been reported cognitive decline. Uh, fortunately, these are also quite rare these days with better targeting. Um, they're usually reversible uh, by adjusting uh, stimulation or turning the stimulation off in, in the worst case scenario. Uh, and with the newer devices, uh, we can actually steer the stimulation away from the area of the brain uh, that's causing the side effects and towards uh, the area that's causing the benefits uh, with a technology called steered current or directional stimulation. And that allows us to really optimize the benefits and minimize the side effects for patients. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, uh, talk to us a little bit about if, so, if this resonates and someone feels they're a good candidate, where can they learn more? Where where would you send them to learn more about the procedure? Yeah, I think um, on the internet, uh, Parkinson's Foundation, parkinson.org, uh, has some great information on deep brain stimulation. Uh, they also designate uh, centers of excellence uh, in, in the United States and around the world. Uh, these are experienced centers that offer the full range of therapy, including surgical options. Uh, so you can meet with someone at one of those centers. Uh, or you can just ask, ask your doctor, your treating doctor, if you might be a candidate. Uh, you know, we were one of these centers of excellence and we work with neurologists locally uh, and nationally and, and most of the centers of excellence do uh, to provide this surgical therapy uh, and then the patients uh, will often go back to their their primary treating physician for most of their care 
Well, tell us a little bit about um, what a typical progression in Parkinson's looks like, um, whether that be walking, uh, abnormal gait, stiffness, trauma, et cetera, and then what it would look like if someone were to receive DBS. Right. You know, so every person with uh, Parkinson's disease is, has a unique course uh, and experience. Uh, but uh, as, as you just alluded to, the, there's these main symptoms that tend to affect most patients, like the tremor or shaking, uh, the rigidity or stiffness, um, the slowness or, or bradykinesia, and, and then the balance uh, or freezing. And each one of those can, can get worse or sort of progress independently uh, on its own timeline. And many patients who once responded well to levodopa uh, now have uh, you know, these more severe wearing off episodes, longer wearing off episodes, uh, higher doses of medication requirements that, that lead to the abnormal movements or dyskinesias. And so with deep brain stimulation, um, the effect on the tremor can be quite dramatic. Uh, we literally turn on the device uh, often in the operating room and, and we can see the tremor uh, disappear or significantly reduce. Uh, immediately. And, and that that's really much like an, an on-off switch. Uh, it's also very effective uh, for the, the stiffness uh, or the, the slowness. Uh, and this can be very helpful at reducing uh, the length of those off periods uh, or making them less severe and also allow for decreases in medications that can allow for reducing those dyskinesias or abnormal movements. Fantastic. Um, you know, in it, I'm basically going to put a timestamp on this interview, and I'm going to mention 20, uh, 2020, 2021, and mention COVID-19. So uh, there's this timestamp for it. But talk to us as we navigate this pandemic. It's been difficult for all of us, but certainly those who have a neurological disease um, in terms of access to exercise, access to wellness. Um, so talk to us about what advice you would give to those people who are battling a neurological disease um, during this pandemic. Right. And certainly, you know, patients with Parkinson's disease do tend to be older and they are vulnerable to, to COVID-19. So I think it's important, you know, that everyone does take the necessary precautions. Um, if you haven't already, uh, you know, get vaccinated. It's, it's safe. It's effective. Um, even once you are vaccinated, you still need to wear a mask and practice social distancing in public. Uh, and then, you know, don't forego medical care. I think that's been a big issue in, in the past year, year and a half. Uh, there's video visits, there's phone visits. Uh, if you do know, need to go into a hospital or see a doctor in person, uh, we've gotten very good at doing that safely uh, over, over the course of the last uh, year and a half of this pandemic. Uh, but I think you know, so, something you know, along the theme of, of what your organization is really focused on is you know, staying active. So find ways to go for a walk or do an exercise class outdoors. Uh, if you have to be indoors, do an online class. I know Power Over Parkinson's uh, offers many of these these resources in both settings, um, and also you know find ways to be social and do things that that you enjoy, even though uh, you may have to be you know not being in the large groups that you would normally like to be. So small groups of vaccinated indiv individuals, uh, being outdoors, doing things by phone or video with friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of options for, for cognitive training or even just playing games that, that keep your brain exercising as well. Uh, these are all really important, uh, no matter what level of severity of, of the Parkinson's disease you have. So even for people with severe disease, severe disease who are undergoing uh, deep brain stimulation, you know, Surgery is not a cure, and it's just part of the therapy for empowering patients. So uh, we're all about letting them get back to the exercise and activity that helps them in many more ways than, than surgery itself. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is don't ignore the Parkinson's disease despite the pandemic. Still try to receive um, that that care. Don't delay do doctor's appointments. Um, get outside, get your physical activity in, and be creative. Um, it sounds like, if I can summarize that. Absolutely. Advice. Uh, so tell us a little bit, um, as we wrap up, tell our listeners where they can learn more about you, Columbia Medical Center, and the research you're conducting. Uh, sure. So uh, you can visit our website, columbianeurosurgery.org, and, and find my page at Our Doctors, or you can just look up my name on, on Google Scholar or PubMed, Brett Youngerman. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really interested in the newest devices uh, that, are, that are coming out that have brain sensing technology, and this is an area of research where uh, we're actually identifying abnormal patterns of brain activity and delivering personalized stimulation uh, in response to that. Uh, so I think we're, we're in a really fortunate time where we have many therapy options available. Uh, and I think we're going to continue to see even more advances uh, in the near future. 
Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And hopefully this interview and the work that you're doing is certainly providing such optimism in, in the time that we're living in as far as the resources and procedures available to those with Parkinson's disease. So on behalf of POP, we thank you for your research and work you're doing in this space. Well, thanks so much for having me. And, and as I said, you know, thank you for, for the work that you're doing at Power Over Parkinson's. You know, I think it's a critical part of, of, of exercise and wellness and having patients be able to manage their disease and, and take, uh, take ownership and feel empowered. Yeah, I think it's definitely a community uh, aspect. We've got the medical community, of course, the um, foundations uh, that can both work together and create this um, holistic care for the patient. So we appreciate your time today, Dr. Youngerman. Thank you. Thanks.